Hi guys, Diana here and I have my baby. It was a little girl and she was born on October 20th. We named her Riley um, and that was the name that we had picked out um, before we had her and it seems to fit her perfectly. So her full name is Riley Esme McNeil and she's just perfect. Um, so today I wanted to tell you my labor and delivery story. Uh, if I look tired and a bit bedraggled, or is that even a word? I don't know. Um, it's probably because I am, but um, yeah, I want to tell my labor and delivery story. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get through this. Um, she's sleeping behind me, and if she wakes up, obviously, that's my priority. So um, I'll try to get through this as fast as possible, but we all know that I'm not very good about being fast. So, um, on with the labor and delivery, um, things did not go as planned, they never do, but uh, that was actually okay. I was able to stay calm through, I'll say most of it, I won't say all of it, because that's absolutely not true, but I was, I mean, calm as in I never became fearful um, because I had planned for things to kind of not go as planned because, you know, it, that's the real world, right? We don't get things exactly the way we want them. But um, I got exactly the baby I wanted, so that's all that matters. Um, yeah, so I went into labor on Monday, October 19th, which would have been uh, 41 weeks exactly. Um, I mean, technically my contraction started the Sunday, the, e the day before. Um, some were late in the evening, but I wasn't even sure if they were... Um, the real contractions are not for labor because it was my first time feeling them. But I had had, but they were very, very few and far between. But every now and again, I would get that contraction where it would start in the back and work its way towards my abdomen, um, which is what I'd read was true labor contractions. Um, so I did have an inkling that I would be meeting my baby soon, but I wasn't sure at that point. But the next morning, so early, around 2 a.m. was when I woke up and um, I started having, well, I don't know at what point I actually started having regular contractions, but at 2 a.m. is when I woke up and I had had a few of them and it kind of like dawned on me that I was like, oh, maybe I should start tracking these a little bit because it seems like these are coming at a consistent pace that these might actually be labor contractions. So I did, and they were coming about every five to 10 minutes apart. So they weren't, they weren't actually um, consistent, but they were consistently throughout, you know, they stayed at five to 10 minutes apart. They never slowed down. They never went less than that. So I was having, um, you know, at least two contractions. Well, not at least two contractions. At that point, it was five to 10 minutes apart. Um, so I think around maybe six o'clock or so, I started having like at least two contractions every 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, to me that's early labor. Um, and that was when, well, no, I think around seven o'clock, that was seven o'clock is when we called labor and delivery ward in hospital. Cause that's what you would do to get the midwife sent to the house for a home delivery. Um, home birth. Um, so around seven o'clock I called and I just let them know that I was having early labor signs um, just for a heads up and they just said you know when my contractions start to become uh, I think they wanted me to have three to four consistently every 10 minutes to call back and that's when they would send the midwife over unless there was any reason that I became fearful or you know that I really felt like a midwife, midwife needed to come right away. Um, I could call that they would come immediately if I really wanted them to. Um, I was happy to wait. I wasn't, you know, the contractions were, uh, I don't want to say they weren't painful because they were painful, but they were definitely bearable. And, you know, I was able to stay calm throughout them. And, you know, we had, me and my husband had a very busy day that day because it was just timing sometimes of how things work out. So, you know, but I managed to get through the day. We had a lot going on. We had a washing machine installed that day, delivered and installed. Um, we had to have an electrician come out that day because of the washing machine being delivered and installed. Uh, I did a lot of cooking that I had planned to do for when I went into labor. 
Um, it was just kind of a crazy, hectic morning. Um, well, the whole day was crazy and hectic, and I was just going through contractions throughout the entire day. I was having two to three contractions every 10 minutes consistently throughout that entire day. They never slowed down. Um, so that night I tried to sleep as best I could, um, which is kind of a joke when you're having contractions like that. So uh, it was more like sometimes I was able to doze off in between, but I think I quit at some point because I really needed to be standing. Laying down was not comfortable at all. The contractions were painful enough that I needed to be able to um, stand up and I was mostly bending over like that was the position that was comfortable for me standing but bent over leaning against something. Um, and for me just you know like doing like moaning like low noises to get through it. Um, and my husband he was the best labor coach. I couldn't have hired somebody to do a better job. I mean, he was absolutely there with me 100% of the time. He took the best care of me. I mean, no one could have done better than him, um, but he was, he would just, you know, put pressure on my back when I needed it. Um, yeah, and it was, you know, it was definitely like there was no issues, no problems. Um, so the next morning, it was, it's funny, it was like a good 24 hours later because it was around two o'clock that I started having the contractions every, where I started having, sorry, I started having uh, three to four contractions every 10 minutes. So I called back the labor and delivery ward and let them know. And they said they'd send the midwife over. So the midwife got um, to our house, I think around uh, 2.30 to like 2.45, I don't know. Um, she got there pretty quickly because I'm pretty sure she examined me for my, um, she examined my, you know, cervix at around three o'clock and I was three centimeters dilated at that point. So the previous day of early labor had gotten me to three centimeters. I don't know how many centimeters, uh, because that was my first cervical exam. I don't know, you know, if I'd only gone from two to three or if I'd gone from one to three or if I'd gone to zero to three. But at that point I was at three centimeters dilated. So, you know, she asked me, she said, you know, you're still pretty early in. Um, do you want me to stay with you? I, I will, she absolutely said she would stay with me. She said, or I could leave and come back in four hours and do another exam to see your progress. So at that point I was still totally comfortable, no issues, no problems. I was happy to let her go home and she was gonna come, just automatically come back for seven o'clock to do the cervical exam. Otherwise, if I needed her at any point, I could call her and she could be at our house like within I think 15 minutes would probably be the longest it would take her to get because she was local. So she came back at seven o'clock and you know, nothing major had happened. I was still having the contractions. My husband was helping me through and it was a really, at that point it was very calm and you know, it was easy. So uh, <laughs> my brain's just going out there. So at, Seven o'clock she came back, she examined me, and I had gone from three to six centimeters. So at that point, obviously she was ready to stay, but she was having a shift change at eight o'clock. So she was going off duty. So we had two new midwives coming over to switch off. Uh, so the two new midwives came and at eight o'clock and she left. Um, my brain is just like all over the place right now, sorry. I'm just trying to like keep things straight in my mind because obviously things get jumbled up because the only thing on my mind that day was just getting through contractions. Like I was so focused on getting through contractions and staying calm that, you know, I didn't pick up on a lot of details. Like some things my husband filled me in on because like I had no idea what was going on. But anyway, so the new two new midwives came. All of the, all of the people that I'd come across throughout my entire labor delivery process were absolutely amazing. Let me just say that, like top notch, couldn't have asked for anything better. It was a really great experience from beginning to end. Um, and I will say the end was in the hospital. Um, clearly I'd said that things didn't go as planned. So I thought that kind of might've hinted at it anyway, but I did end up in hospital um, at the very, very, very end of it all. Um, so anyway, but even the hospital experience was, 
it was still amazing, honestly. Like, I have no complaints about how anything was handled or taken care of. Like, it was a great experience. So, the new midwives came at 8 o'clock. And so, my next check would be four hours after that. So, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So, I was checked again at 11. Um, and I think... I don't remember exactly. I think maybe I was at an eight, eight centimeters dilated at that point, but I'm not positive. I'm pretty sure I was eight centimeters dilated. It was, it was at least eight. Yeah, and I, I wasn't at a nine yet. I was eight centimeters dilated, but I think at that point that I must have been close to a nine because it was shortly after that that I'd started like really like doing that transition period, going through that transition period where the contractions started to become more painful, more intense. Um, yeah, another, I mean, all the details in between that I'm skipping out on, I'm not actually skipping out on any details. Like there were no details to really go through. It was pretty much the same thing. I just took each contraction as I could. Um, I did get in the bath a couple times. Um, both of the times that I'd gone into the bath were when midwives weren't around. It's not that I wouldn't have gotten in the bath when the midwives are around. It's just it happened to be when midwives weren't in the home that I was in the bath. Um, and honestly, it didn't do that much for my contractions as far as pain goes. So I wasn't, you know, I got out of the bathtub. So I'm happy that I didn't plan for a water birth because, you know, I would have had to have like set up a pool and it just would have taken up the space that I was using for my birthing. And I probably wouldn't have really enjoyed it much because for me, being in the water, it didn't do anything to get rid of any kind of pain relief. It was just, I mean, the, the nice thing that it did was it took, you know, weight off of my body as far as just like the weight I was carrying in my stomach. But otherwise, it wasn't like anything of a big deal or else I would have been in the bathtub a lot more than I was. So back to where I was going. Oh, and throughout the entire thing, my husband was... He was keeping me so hydrated. He was, you know, bringing me water, juice. I think I went through like probably like nearly 10. I think we had like seven or eight coconuts that I had gone through. Um, yeah, he was just constantly bringing me drinks. Um, he was amazing. Like I said, he was perfect. So, yeah. 11 o'clock, I was at eight centimeters. I'm pretty sure I pr had progressed to like nine fairly quickly. I don't remember exactly what time I'd gotten through the pushing, had gotten to the pushing stage, but I do know that we'd left the house at 3.30. I was pushing for an hour and a half. So two o'clock I would have started pushing. So between 11 o'clock and two o'clock, I'd obviously gone from, you know, eight to 10 and was pushing. So at some point when I was at, well, I was already, I was 10 centimeters dilated. I was fully effaced. My waters hadn't broken yet. And I know I'm not filling in times anymore, but it's just at this point, like I have no idea what time anything happened, but I was ready to go. My waters hadn't broken, but baby wasn't progressing down. So the midwives had asked for permission to break my waters because um, as they had explained, they thought that the baby wasn't coming down anymore because the water was getting in the way, which can happen. Um, and that was something that I'd read about before, like one of the reasons that it would actually be beneficial to break your waters in labor. Because otherwise I'd actually had it on my birth plan that I didn't want artificial rupture of my membranes. Um, but with the understanding that, you know, anything that was on my birth plan could be changed obviously with my permission. So they asked for my permission. And they explained that they thought that that was the reason why baby girl wasn't coming down. Except we didn't know it was baby girl at the time. Um, yeah. So she was like right there, but not coming down any further. So they thought it was the waters that were kind of getting in the way of it as if like she couldn't put enough pressure on my cervix because of it. So they broke my waters. Um, which I was happy to consent to at that point because, you know, if baby wasn't going anywhere, like, what was I going to do? So they broke my waters. And actually, after they broke my waters, my contractions actually slowed down, which is not very common. Generally, it goes in the opposite direction. Um, most people, when your waters are broken, 
your contractions get more intense. So, um, but anyway, they weren't worried about that. They just said that, you know, things change. Like, yeah, it's more common for your contractions to speed up afterwards, but in general, just breaking of the waters changes the labor patterns. So my contractions at that point actually went back to being like every five to 10 minutes apart. So they were like really slow apart, which I think at that point I really needed because they were so, that was when they were obviously very painful because I was at the pushing stage and they were like intense. And that was, oh, and I hadn't said, sorry. So I'd done like the majority of the labor without any pain relief. And I think it must, it was after I'd been examined by the midwives at 11. So sometime after 11, I started taking gas and air. Um, I definitely would have used it in general, but I think when I started using it, I probably could have held off a bit longer, but it was just like everyone around me was like, hey, you know, you have the gas and air there, like you can use it. Cause I was obviously moaning a bit louder. Um, although funny enough, my husband actually mentioned afterwards, he was like, you know, I was really surprised that you never cursed throughout the entire thing. And I was like, I didn't. Cause I don't, cause I'm, I kind of have like a potty mouth sometimes, especially like, you know, when you have no inhibitions. I mean, I was standing around my house, butt naked. And I mean, every time somebody wanted to look at something, I would just spread. So I was surprised that I hadn't cursed at all, but I guess I was like really calm. Like I didn't have any worries or anything. So yeah, sometime after 11 o'clock, like maybe 12 or so, I don't, I have no idea. I started using the gas and air um, through my contractions. So, um, and what you do with that is just basically right when you feel the contraction starting, you start breathing in with it. And then basically I would stop just when I felt like I could handle the rest of the contraction on my own. So I wasn't using it throughout the entire contraction. I would just use it just enough to like take the edge off for me. Um, yeah, so anyway, by the time I was pushing, we actually had, we were running out of gas and air because the midwives assumed, at the time they had gone to pick up, I think, more gas and air, and they assumed that I would only need one tube of it, um, just because things were progressing really well throughout the pregnancy. They were progressing at a really good uh, pregnancy. Throughout the labor, they were progressing really quickly. Um, even though I was in labor for so long, that was actually like for like a natural labor, first labor, you know, not having like drugs like Pitocin or anything involved. Um, you know, that was what they'd, you know, I was progressing like at a good pace and they thought that, they thought baby roll was gonna come out really quickly because I was handling the pain really well. I was really calm. You know, everything was going the way it should have gone. So there was no reason for them to think that like they would have needed extra gas and air. Well, it turns out that I was pushing for a good hour and a half and we were running out of gas and air. Um, and at this point, because I'd gotten used to it, the thought of like not having it, I feel like I probably could have gone like, I don't know, I might've even made it, like I probably could have done it even without the gas and air, I don't know. But once you start using it, it does become a crutch. So. Regardless, we were running out. Um, but at the end, when you're pushing, they don't want you to use um, the gas and air throughout the entire thing because they want to make sure they were saying that they they really want you to feel like the push, like you want they want you to be able to put a lot into it. So when I was pushing, what they would do is they'd tell me right when the contraction started to take one good breath of the gas and air in, and then use that just to give me you know the little oomph I needed to push. And I was bearing down with everything I had inside of me and they were telling me I needed to push harder. And I was like, I can't, I can't like, like I knew I was giving it everything I had. So at that point, you know, they had just thought that, you know, I was running out of energy because I hadn't eaten anything that entire day. Um, the last thing I'd eaten was the day before at dinner time. Um, yeah, so at that point, it'd been nearly 24 hours since I had solid food. I'd only eaten, I don't, the only calories I'd consumed had come from juice or the coconut water. Um, and, you know, I, I assumed the same thing at that point. Like, I assumed that, because 
as far as I knew, I was pushing with everything I had inside of me. And like, you know, I, if baby girl wasn't coming out, I felt like it must be because I was failing. Like, you know, I hadn't taken in enough calories or, you know, whatever it was, I didn't have the energy. Um, and you know, an hour and a half of doing that, like I would say like the last 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so of doing it, like I completely lost my shit. Like that was when, you know, that I, I lost my shit. Like I went from like calm and just doing it to just, you know, like I was like, I'd given, I didn't even want to push through contractions anymore. I had no gas and air left though at this point. And I like, you know, they would tell me to push through contractions and like, I would maybe give like one half hearted push and then it'd be like, I can't, I can't like, it's, you know, it's not working. I was like, I can't do this. You know, um, the midwives had suggested that I go to hospital and, uh, well, they call it Syntacin in this country, in the UK. Um, but Syntacin is the synthetic form of oxytocin. So it's what you would know of as ox uh, Pitocin in the US. Um, so they suge suggested that I go to hospital to get a little bit of that and that would give me what I needed to push the baby out. Because at that point, my contractions, I had said, had slowed down to like, you know, five to ten minutes apart and they were just going slower and slower as time progressed. Um, and I had like looked at my husband and I was like, no. And, I, and actually what I did was I was like, I want an epidural. I don't want... I don't want Syntacin. I was like, I want an epidural. And I was like looking at my husband. I feel like I was, I think I was crying at that point. Cause in my mind, I knew I couldn't push her out and having more contractions wasn't going to help me push her out. I was like, if I have a problem with like my energy, like I just knew I couldn't do it. Um, and I was just looking at him and I was like, I want an epidural. And he was, I, he had like this look on his face. Like he was really surprised and shocked because obviously he knows that like, I'm really against that kind of stuff, but like, I just knew that my body didn't have it in me at that point. Well, that's what I thought because I just, I, I knew that I was pushing with everything I had inside of me. Like I knew that that's, that's, that's what I had, you know, I was giving it all I had and she wasn't coming out that, you know, I just, I was like, the only way I'm going to get her out naturally, naturally, as far as I mean, vaginally, um, would be to have the epidural to be able to just push through the pain even harder, regardless of being tired. Whereas in my mind, the uh, Syntacin would just equate to me end up having, ending up having to have a C-section, which I do actually think probably would have happened if that was the route that we chose. Um, it's basically, so we went to hospital, I ended up getting a spinal because a spinal is faster and they needed to just they wanted to just get the baby out of me really quickly. Um, and I would have ended up having the spinal anyway, because once I got to the hospital, um, basically I was going in for, they were gonna try to take her out with forceps or, cause, so, well, I'm, I don't even know how timing went at this point. So anyway, I was brought to the hospital by ambulance. The ambulance had gas and air. The entire time I was in the ambulance, I was like sucking on that gas and air like a maniac because like I said, I'd lost my shit at that point. Like I like this is when I was like, you know, I felt like a failure because I felt like, I, you know, like I would completely failed. Um, you know, I remember I was like apologizing to my husband like over and over again because I felt like I'm getting teary eyed right now, even though like now looking back on it, everything happened the way it needed to happen. And there was no other way around it as far, well, in my eyes, there was no other way around it. I mean, I'm sure people can always disagree however they want to, but, um, you know, I was like apologizing to my husband like profusely because I felt like I wasn't giving my baby the best start, you know, that it was my own fault that she wasn't coming out without drugs. Um, you know, I was just, I'd lost it. And I was like sucking in the gas and air, like, even when I wasn't having contractions, I was taking it because I felt like I just wasn't remembering to breathe. And I was just like, <laughs> and they, they actually like the midwife was in the ambulance with me. My husband was in the ambulance with me. And obviously there was a person from the ambulance that was in the back with me. And they were like trying to remind me to like not use the gas and air when I didn't need it because I could actually breathe. Because like I just, 
like my mental abilities were just gone at that point. I was just sucking it in, sucking it in. So yeah, at that point, oh, so I'd labored at home for 37 hours. And I would say a good 36 of those hours were super calm, super calm. And then it just went and hit a switch. But like I said, I'd lost my shit and like, I was like a mess, but I never felt unsafe. I don't regret starting at home. I actually think that being at home and starting it enabled me to have a vaginal delivery. I think if I'd done this in hospital, I think I would have ended up with a C-section because I don't think I would have progressed as far as I had. Um, I don't think I would have been able to progress as far as I had um, without getting to a C-section basically. So anyway, I never felt unsafe. Like even though, you know, I felt like a failure or something like I, I felt, you know, I knew my baby girl was coming. I wasn't worried about that. You know, I just, I just wanted to get her out. You know what I mean? I mean, at that point it was really painful because she was right at the exit door. Oh, this is the thing that I wasn't. So that whole time I was pushing, she was like right there. Like they could see her head. They could see that she had hair. Um, she just wasn't coming down any further. So like that whole time she hadn't progressed any further down. Um, and you know, they just thought I wasn't pushing hard enough. So once we got to the hospital, um, you know, I was put into theater and because I had to sign off for a C-section at the same time that I was signing off for the spinal and a assisted delivery. So she was brought out into the world with forceps which obviously isn't the nicest way to come into the world, but it was actually uh, necessary to bring her out. So, oh, and I had an episiotomy, so I've got some lovely stitches in me, um, which is obviously very far from my plan of having a home birth. But um, it turned out the reason she wasn't coming down is because she had a abnormally short cord, um, you know, attached to the placenta, and it was also tangled around her body so she had no slack to actually come down. And that was actually why once they broke my waters, my contractions slowed down because they were trying to, I guess that was my body's way of trying to, you know, not put stress on her because throughout my entire uh, labor and delivery, she never had any problems with her heartbeat. It was consistently at 140, uh, well, like 130 to 140. And then obviously you have the fluctuations when you have the contractions and everything, which are normal. But, you know, her heart rate was always really good. And I think that that was my body's way of, like, slowing down the contractions so she wasn't being, like, forced down. I think that was my body's way of protecting her. Um, so I'm thankful for that, you know. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, she had an abnormally short cord that was wrapped around her that ended up, she had no slack to actually move. So she wasn't going anywhere. Um, so with the forceps, they were able to pull her out, thank God. I got her out in two contractions once I had the spinal and the episiotomy and the forceps. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, you know, the first contraction pushed her head out. The second contraction pulled out her body. Um, we weren't able to do the immediate skin to skin because of the short cord. And, um, you know, the placenta came out almost immediately afterwards because of the short cord, it was like, I basically, them pulling her out, pulled out the placenta, like, with it. Um, it didn't actually come out in one go, but I mean, it slipped out, like, I mean, right after, you know, they'd been like, it's a girl. It was like, oh, and here's your placenta. <laughs> um, yeah, so I delivered my placenta. I mean, I think it was like less than a minute after I delivered the baby. It was really fast. Um, yeah, so actually, baby girl went into my husband's arms first, um, just cause that's how it happens. You know, it's, it's very different from a home birth experience, but, um, you know, I was just so happy to see that everything was okay. I mean, she was screaming bloody murder like the whole time. So I knew she had, you know, clear passageway with her lungs. Um, yeah. And when I finally got to have her on me, um, I have no idea how much time passed, but it was probably, I mean, it felt like forever, but in the reality, it was probably like 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, I have no idea, but when I finally had her on me, um, I was wearing a 
gown for the surgery, even though I didn't have surgery, but, um, you know, because they didn't know what was going to happen, um, I had to put on their standard gown. And, um, yeah, so I was wearing the, the gown, and because of that, I couldn't do skin to skin because it was in the way, and they were still stitching me up below, so I couldn't be moved anywhere. Um, so she was, like, all the way up here, and she was already rooting and, like, looking for my nipple, but because she wasn't down here, she couldn't find it. But I just remember that feeling that I was like, oh, she wants to nurse. Like, she knows how to nurse. Like, this is, like, beautiful, you know? And she did. As soon as they got me out of that gown and she was put to my breast she started breastfeeding right away she's been such a great feeder um yeah and like my hospital stay everybody that I came across was amazing even being um so my experience in theater when you know I was delivering her I had two of the most amazing women standing like straight over my face because obviously like you know I was like still like all upset and everything um because in that moment you know it's not what you planned and in that moment I was just still like a complete mess and like you know I had one like right over my face like telling me like you're doing a great job you're doing beautiful like this is you're wonderful and another one like over my face going you're gonna meet your baby soon your baby you're gonna meet your baby today like your baby's coming out aren't you excited and it was just, you know, such soothing voices and it was a great experience. I don't know how else to say it. Like, you know, you hear so many horror stories about hospital births. And I will say, like, I had a great experience giving birth in the hospital. I mean, obviously, I would have preferred to have her at home. But um, and my experience with the midwives at home, amazing. My hospital stay, I was in the hospital for um, just over 24 hours because I'd come in and deliver she was delivered at 5 16 and I think I went home the next day around nine o'clock at night so just a little bit more than 24 hours I was in hospital um and actually I would have been ready to go home the next morning um the only reason they'd kept me was because it's like every of every every other hospital you've ever been in you know short staff so like the checks and stuff that they wanted to do on me and baby um you know had to wait as people could actually make the time to see me so you know that's fine we went home at like nine o'clock the next day and everybody that I came across so many people in that time period with shift changes and everything like I had multiple midwives multiple nurses you know pediatricians like everyone was wonderful like I had such a good experience so yeah that was my labor and delivery story and I'm going to show you a quick shot of baby girl because that's probably what you guys really wanted to see anyway um and I've been talking for a really long time I'm really lucky that she hasn't woken up but I'm actually probably gonna I hear her kind of making little noises so she's like awake she's just not crying so I'm going to show you her and I will talk to you guys later. I'm going to try to do a one week uh, postpartum update because I do feel like I had a lot happen in this past week that might be nice to mention and helpful for people. Um, well, I definitely have a lot to talk about that I think could be helpful um, that I haven't heard other people bring up in their postpartum videos that I've watched. I'm sure somebody out there has, but I haven't heard of them bring it up. So I'm going to try to do that tomorrow because tomorrow I will be one week postpartum. I'm not sure if that'll happen. Um, and I'm not sure if I want to do a one week baby update just because well, she has had a lot happen this week. It's also she hasn't. It's really been more about the changes I feel like I felt in my body. I mean, I might do I feel like it would probably be better to wait until she's like a month to do an update on her but um I'm not sure we'll, we'll see what happens but I want to try to do a one week postpartum update um and you know maybe when I get to two weeks I'll feel like I have something to say about her but she's a newborn she sleeps she eats she eats amazing she, she sleeps eats poops pees you know and sometimes she's alert <laughs> um but just a little bit at the time. Mostly she sleeps and eats and poops and pees. But, you know, 
not much else to say about that. There's the one week update for her. So I'll show you a little clip of her and I'll shut up and uh, I'll go back to being a mommy. So uh, yeah, that was it. Um, I need sleep. That's why I'm like all over the place. I'm always all over the place, but right now I'm a little bit wired. Um, yeah, I will talk to you guys later. I'm going to say goodbye now and I'll show you a little clip of the baby girl. Thanks. And this is my absolutely beautiful, perfect baby girl, Riley Esme. And she is wearing right now a little sleep suit that she got gifted from her lovely cousin, Georgia. Georgia picked that sleep suit out just for Riley. So that's one of the uh, very few girl specific outfits that Riley owns at the moment since everything else that we have is unisex but um she's just the most beautiful perfect thing in the world and I can't believe that my husband and I created her she's just such a joy to have in our life